This morning's reading is from Ruth, chapter 1, verses 22 to uh, 2, verses 23. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now, listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward will be given you by the Lord. The God of Israel, under his wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was of an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a cross relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the reading from God's Word today. Last week, we began uh, verse by verse through Ruth, and in the first chapter, we discovered that Naomi's bitterness towards God was misguided. First, her hardship was a result of human decision and disobedience. Elimelech and his family deserved and were the cause of everything that they suffered. Second, despite this fact, God cared intimately for Elimelech's family. The continuation of his line and their ultimate outcome are in God's hands, and he cares intimately for Naomi in her suffering. And just because these people deserved ultimate judgment from God doesn't mean he has been their enemy. He is taking all of this situation, the result of human rebellion, and working it out for their good. 
God has extended his hesed to Elimelech's family. That is, his devoted covenantal love and faithfulness. The mercy, grace, kindness, and loyalty he unfailingly expresses to those who are called according to his purpose. Going far beyond the requirements of justice or duty to cause their ultimate good. And so the main passage of our pas- uh, main point of our passage this morning is to see this meticulous provision of God at work, both in the seemingly ordinary circumstances of life, which are not merely random events, but are divinely orchestrated occasions, and through the work of His people as they take the opportunity and initiative to practice this has said themselves. Ruth 1.22, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. The last verse of the first chapter is what sets the stage for the second act of Ruth by summarizing all of the critical information. It also introduces the main theme by stating two things which will be critical for the salvation of Naomi, the filling of her emptiness. The first is the critical and providential timing of the return to Bethlehem, because it means that Naomi and Ruth arrive at the house of bread just when the grain for bread is ready to be cut. And since barley was the very first crop which would be harvested each year, the timing of their arrival meant that Naomi and Ruth could get settled and store up food uh, so they could allow them this ongoing, if meager, existence. The, The second is the small detail that Naomi's husband had a contemporary, a blood relative of unspecified proximity, who is an Ish Gabor Hayil, which the English standard translates a worthy man. But it is an ambiguous expression capable of a wide range of meanings. It usually means a war hero. But in another context, it can also connote a a capable man of means. In the context of a wealthy landowner who commands many servants, it describes Boaz as a powerful person someone whose wealth and high reputation in Bethlehem gave him strong influence among his peers. But as we've seen, the book of Ruth is firmly framed within the context of the book of Judges, where this title is always translated, as it is in Judges 6.12, a mighty man of valor. There are two descriptions in this phrase, Uh, which implies strength and nobility. But by using this phrase, the author invites us to compare Boaz with Gideon and other men of valor. And shockingly, the author also applies the second part of this phrase to Ruth in chapter 3, verse 11, when Boaz says to her, all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman, a woman of valor. And so Boaz is wealthy, and and that could be what it connotes, but since Ruth is not wealthy, we should see that Boaz is not so much introduced as a man of means, but more specifically, he is introduced on the, the tail end of Judges as a mighty man of valor, which also fits with his name, which is found nowhere else in any literature of the ancient world other than as the name of a mighty pillar in Solomon's temple. But the the pillar would have been named after this Boaz, if anything, not the other way around. Boaz pre-exists the pillar. But most of the the nearest terms from similar language suggest that his name means something like, in him strength. And so Boaz is a strong man, a mighty man of valor. And this brief introduction to Boaz foreshadows a glimmer of hope. Not only is he a mighty man, but he is a relative of Elimelech. A small detail which raises the interests and hopes of the early readers, especially those who are familiar with Israelite family law and custom. And so now our story has a hero to complement its heroine, which is promising. It also gives us the opportunity to consider what does it mean to be a mighty man of valor 
in the time of peace. Verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So once again, the author reminds us that Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. Three times in a very short period, we've been reminded Boaz is a relative of Elimelech, and significantly this this foreshadows the future solution for Naomi's family. It also introduces Ruth once again as the Moabite. This emphasizes her lack of status. She was an ethnic outsider, an unattached woman in a patriarchal culture, but the mention of her race also highlights the extraordinary nature of her actions. And she is so dedicated to Naomi And she politely requests permission from her mother-in-law to go out and get some food for them both. To glean or to gather scraps is to be distinguished from the ordinary type of harvesting, that it involves picking up the ears of grain that the harvesters have inadvertently dropped or left standing in the field. It was a labor-intensive activity with sometimes very little to show for it. Uh, The gleaning of fallen grain was mere subsistence living, much like trying to eke out survival today by recycling aluminum, aluminum cans. This wouldn't be a, something that would sustain them well. One difference in Israel, though, was that under the Mosaic law, landowners were required by law to show particular compassion for the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow by having their, their harvesters deliberately leave the grain at the corners of their fields for these economically vulnerable classes and not to go back to gather ears of grain that they may have dropped. This is in Leviticus 19.9 and Deuteronomy 24.19. In doing so, Israelite farmers were to recognize the full authority of Yahweh himself as the true legal landowner. This was God's land. They had it on loan. And so Israelite farmers might be the means of provision, but the great compassionate landlord was actually the generous benefactor of the poor. As a Moabite and a widow, Ruth could qualify to glean on two counts. But for these same two reasons, she could not count on the goodwill of the locals, hence her concern to glean behind someone who would look upon her with favor. This woman of valor showed remarkable initiative and courage in order to implement the devotion that she had promised to Naomi earlier in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Fields that were tilled and harvested by hand were not overly large, and everyone was in their portion of the barley field that day. You you could probably see from any vantage point several different landowners and their workers all at once working in their portion of the field. And so when Ruth went out to glean, verse 3, and happened to come to Boaz's portion, we are meant to see God's providence in her choice of field that day. The author literally writes, Her chance chanced upon the portion of Boaz, which literarily is hyperbole, a striking understatement intended to create the exact opposite impression. A modern idiom would be to say, by a stroke of sheer luck. By a stroke of sheer luck, she found the field of the man we were just talking about, this mighty man of valor, who just happens to be a relative of Elimelech. Now, any Orthodox Israelite or Christian knows that there's no such thing as luck or chance. Uh, Proverbs 16.33 declares, the lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. But if the Lord even determines how the dice falls, how can the narrator speak, speak so explicitly of chance? Her chance chanced. It's a double chance. And it's, it's a deliberate rhetorical device By excessively attributing Ruth's good fortune to chance, he forces us to sit up and take notice, to ask questions concerning the significance of everything that is transpiring. It is an ironic statement designed to undermine any purely rational explanation for Ruth's experience and to refine our understanding of God's providence and his meticulous provision. Nothing happens without God deciding it is so. 
By saying that Ruth chanced upon a chance, the narrator shouts, see the hand of God at work here. The same hand that had sent that famine and later provided food is the very same hand that brought Naomi and Ruth to Bethlehem precisely at the beginning of the barley harvest and has now providentially guided Ruth to that portion of the field specifically belonging to Boaz. And then, wouldn't you know it, Boaz shows up. What a coincidence. Verse 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. When Boaz takes the stage for the first time, his first words are a blessing, reminding his reapers of the presence of Yahweh. And immediately following the ironic statement about chance, the greeting blessing of Boaz and his workers repeat the name of God twice, as if to drive home the message that God is at work here in this very field. The narrator calls the foreman a young man, which emphasizes Boaz's age. And when Boaz asks him who the young woman is, the foreman twice mentions her Moabite ancestry before offering up additional information, which immediately speaks to her character. She has asked permission to glean, which was not required under Israelite law. This was her right But you have to understand that Ruth, again, a young Moabite woman, had to be very cautious in a foreign land without male protection. The Hebrew is difficult in verse 7, and there is little consensus among scholars, but I think it is more likely that she showed up early in the morning and has waited for permission, since the foreman hasn't given it to her yet. And he probably was unsure if he should for such a foreigner. And when I say that the Hebrew is difficult, the final statement reads literally, this her sitting the house little. That's the the literal Hebrew of that last section, which they they render except for a short rest. So she was a little in the house, which could mean that she, uh, without spending too much time explaining all the possible interpretations, either Ruth has worked very diligently all morning without much rest, or else she has waited all morning for an answer without going home. And this because of her status as an immigrant. Verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when they are th- when, when you are thirsty, sorry, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. From first to last, Boaz, whenever he opens his mouth, his tone exudes compassion, grace, and generosity. This is a mighty man of valor. This is a man in whom the very idea of biblical said has become flesh and dwells among humankind. Both Naomi and Boaz regularly address Ruth as my daughter. As with the fact that Boaz was a contemporary of Elimelech, this strongly suggests that Boaz and Naomi are of the same generation, and there's a significant disparity of age separating him from Ruth. He does not address her as an interested suitor, but intentionally distances them by age differential and relates to her with the tenderness and proper distance of an elder male relative. And like Naomi, he gives her instruction as one who is looking out for the younger relative. Stay in this field. Keep close to my servant girls. Literally, cling to them. Don't worry about the young man. I've warned them not to touch you. Which, this incidentally, is the first anti-sexual harassment policy in the workplace ever recorded. And finally, she is to drink from the water that Boaz's young men have drawn, which is extraordinary because normally in the ancient Near East, foreigners would draw water for Israelites and women would draw it for men. 
Verse 10, then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full report or full reward, sorry, be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Ruth refers to herself. These two words, servants, at the end are different. One is, is one of his servants. She refers to herself as, as a female servant of the lowest status in Israel. A a female servant with such low status that she would not even be possibly considered for marriage. And she prostrates herself, demonstrating in graphic symbolism both the great age and social distance between her and Boaz, but also her gratitude for his kindness. Ruth cannot believe that Boaz is so unfazed by the fact that she is a Moabite. And clearly, this had been an issue for others and the foreman earlier. Her question demonstrates just how unusual it would be for someone to show show such specific and direct kindness to someone so far below them on the social and economic ladder. Clearly, Boaz was a generous man, and he followed the law concerning care for the poor in general. He was not reaping to the corners of his field. There were gleaners following after his harvesters, people who were coming to just get enough food to eat, though they were poor, immigrants, widows, and orphans. But the specific care he shows to Ruth is astonishing. Her words echo her earlier wish in verse 2 and repeat the same idiom when she expresses her hope to glean after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And so to the audience who had heard these earlier words, we hear Ruth saying, I have found the one I was looking for, and he exceeds my expectations. She says twice, I have found favor in your eyes. Now, in a short story, we should remember that the author has only included what is important to communicate the intended message. And so when a character expresses the motivation for their actions, we should sit up and notice. Why has Ruth found favor in the eyes of Boaz? Verse 11, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The author doesn't tell us what Boaz's marriage status is, only that he is an older man. We might assume that he is a widower himself, and that certainly makes sense, but the Bible does not tell us that, and there's a reason. If if the Bible did tell us that he was a widower, we would add the conclusion that he was a lonely widower has taken an interest in this foreign girl. Neither does the author tell us whether or not Ruth is beautiful. She may have been. We don't know. We only know that this was not the motivation for Boaz's kindness. The book of Ruth is a very great romance, but it is not your run-of-the-mill Hallmark romance. Boaz is not motivated by loneliness or infatuation, but because he has quickly realized that Ruth has shown Hased covenant loyalty and love to his relative's widow. And so Boaz shows with his actions that he has already welcomed Ruth and recognized her as part of his kinship circle and responsibility. Boaz immediately realizes that because she was caring for his kinswoman, that he has a responsibility towards her. In sum, Boaz's kindness towards Ruth simply reciprocated hers towards Naomi. Now, at this point, Ruth does not even know that Naomi is an important person to Boaz and one for whom he is considering his own kinship responsibilities, but he makes clear that his generosity was in response to her acts of kindness towards her mother-in-law. Boaz also makes it clear 
that he does not consider his small kindnesses to Ruth to be sufficient reciprocation in response to the great covenant loyalty she has shown to Naomi. Verse 12, he prays, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. As in Naomi's prayer in chapter one, Boaz recognizes that though Ruth is an ethnic Moabite, her deeds of kindness to Naomi, an Israelite, shows that she, who is formerly an outsider, is now someone who can expect the God of Israel to discharge his covenant obligations towards her. Boaz prays for God to repay Ruth's kindness and that her wages would be full, which implies that he considered the debt so large that only God himself could fully repay it. And Boaz is so confident that our God of order, our good God, would repay Ruth's true hesed. He describes her as someone who is already, right then, experiencing refuge under the wing of Yahweh. This word can mean wing or corner of a garment, which comes into play later. But Boaz draws on an image that was common in the ancient Near East, a beautiful picture of divine care where God is like a mother bird who covers her young under the protection of her wings. She's keeping, God's keeping her close, keeping her covered and protected. He himself is is aware and alert, looking over her every need and concern. And again, it is obvious that, that Naomi and Boaz have both recognized that Ruth the Moabite has experienced a transfer of membership. Not only because she has renounced the gods of Moab to claim the God of Israel as her divine patron and protector, but because she herself has lived out God's own hesed, loyal love to Elimelech's family. This love for the people of God identifies her as one who is a true Israelite. And in this, Boaz represents the church very well. Because the church is to recognize those who love the people of God as the people of God. Someone shows themselves to be a true believer, a true disciple by the way they love Christians. And so when we meet someone who loves the people of God, we immediately have a kinship with them. We know they are our brother and sister in Christ. We don't immediately know that someone is our brother and sister because they say, I'm a Christian. We don't immediately know they are our brother or sister because they attend a church or this church. We know we are family when we see the way they love the people of God. And so this is what Boaz has done. Boaz has recognized very quickly, very early, he has the wisdom of God to recognize that Ruth is part of the family now. And so he treats her appropriately. Uh, Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her and also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. After his previous speech, we quickly discover that though Boaz seeks God's hands in restitution for Ruth, he has not yet exhausted his own generosity towards her. In the ancient Near East, people did not eat only to satisfy hungry stomachs. Eating together also had a great symbolic significance. It is a a very bold and, and loud message of acceptance. Remember, this is this is a foreigner. Not just a foreigner, but a daughter of the enemies of God's people. This is is an immigrant from the country that your country has been at war with. And Boaz quickly accepts her and makes it clear that she's one of his people. The fact that Boaz ate with his harvester says something about the man. But his actions at this meal must have caught everyone by surprise. He invites this foreigner, this outsider, a Moabite, to join him and his workers. And not only that, but he goes far beyond. He serves her with his 
own hand, his own fare, enough to satisfy her hunger and even more to take home. Now, obviously, this verse is not simply about feeding the hungry. We see how Boaz took an ordinary occasion and transformed it into a glorious demonstration of compassion, generosity, and acceptance. In short, the biblical understanding of said. The text offers no hint of romantic attraction between Boaz and Ruth. Given the racial and social barriers that separated them, the thought would probably not have crossed their mind. And at this point, Ruth does not even know that he was a kinsman of her deceased husband. For the sake of Elimelech's family, and for the sake of Naomi, Boaz treated Ruth as family, welcoming her as a member of his own entourage. Not only is he a generous man in general, this is just not how everyone should treat all the poor. This is not how Boaz treated all the gleaners. He recognized that he had a specific responsibility towards Ruth because of Naomi, his kinsman's widow. And so he elevates her above the other gleaners. He allows her to glean ahead of them and in the portions of the field that were off limits to them. The harvesters are even instructed to pull out what they have already gathered and leave it for her to glean. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. This result of of Ruth's work and Boaz's generosity are nothing, nothing short of amazing. Uh, scholars are not totally agreed on the size of an alpha, but they're, because there could have been different standards at different times and places, but by any standard, this was an extraordinary feat undertaken by this young woman as she gathered and then threshed and then carried home somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds of barley, over half a bushel. In comparison, the payment for a male worker who was there being paid to do the harvesting was rarely more than two pounds a day. So this meant that Ruth collected the equivalent of at least half a month's wages for a laborer in one day. Such a startling quantity of grain testified both to Boaz's generosity and to Ruth's industry, both out of the hesed they had towards Naomi, both as demonstrations of God's hesed to Naomi, no, Naomi, who in the last chapter was emptied, is being filled by the love of God expressed through the love of his people. Verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Naomi's response to Ruth's, Ruth's success is one of the key theological expressions in the whole book. She says, verse 20, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Kindness here, once again, is that word hesed, God's covenant love. And we're meant to see by the mention of the living and the dead that God has not abandoned Elimelech's family. Remember, for for Elimelech to have his family line cut off was an ultimate and permanent judgment from God. But God has not cut off Elimelech despite his rebellion, despite his disobedience. God has been faithful to Elimelech and to Elimelech's widow and continues to express his grace, kindness, loyal love, and covenant faithfulness to the objects of his mercy. 
Naomi recognizes here that a man who is living out Hesed towards her was evidence that God has not forsaken his covenant love. The second comment, also in verse 20, is another of the most important notions in the book, that of a kinsman redeemer. She says he is one of our redeemers. And and we've read the story in completion, and we have some idea of what that means, but I'm going to leave that off for another day because it's a whole other can of worms. But I want to focus back in, uh, we'll introduce the next act with that, but what have we learned in Act 2? What have we learned in this second chapter of Ruth? What some call chance, luck, or fate, the Bible attributes to the sovereign hand of God. The clear implication is that every circumstance in this story has been superintended by God. The way the Ruth just happens upon a certain field and where Boaz unexpectedly just happens to show up. We could also add that Ruth is not assaulted in the field or on her way, a concern which is mentioned seven different times in such a short story. God's purview is not only in mighty signs and miracles, works of wonder, but also in the mundane and everyday. If this book teaches anything, it is that the Lord is in sovereign control. While we are called on to live our lives in accordance with his word, it is the Lord who providentially providentially supplies our needs and orders our lives for good, Romans 8.28. God superintends in the details of life. The book of Ruth demonstrates that peace and well-being, the shalom of God, is possible in the midst of personal catastrophes and amidst societal degeneration as in the days of the judges, just as it is today. God is mightily at work even when it looks like the world around us is going to hell in a handbasket. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry about how it's going to work out. God is sovereignly in control. He's sovereignly overseeing our personal struggles, pains, and catastrophes. And he is personally overseeing our society. Even we see the wrath of God revealed in our world today. When God is at work, however bitterly hopeless the beginning, it can result in surprising good. When we are in similar desperate straits, we may see in simple food at the table and in loyal friends the very work of God, his chesed sustaining and guiding us until the day that he dispels the darkness. We also see that this sovereign control, the meticulous provision of God, is on display in the obedience of his people. Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and decision to stick with her and feed her with the efforts of her own labor is the provision of God. And Boaz's response to Ruth's kindness and the kindness he himself shows to Naomi through Ruth are activities of divine care. Earlier I left you with the question, what does it mean to be a mighty man of valor in the days of peace? And now I'll add, what does it mean to be a woman of valor? Few of us will be in the fields harvesting the edges. And few of us will find foreign widows gleaning in our fields. But opportunities to practice said are all around us. And not just in some religious setting. It was not in a religious setting that Ruth or Boaz manifested their said. It is in the daily interactions, the regular every day. Such manifestations of said of Hesed, sorry, are the result of commitment to the Lord. Ruth takes the initiative, takes risk. This doing biblical Hesed will require finding out how we can help someone. It's not always going to fall into our lap. It's not always going to be a message from the pulpit of here's what you can give. 
It means looking for opportunity to show covenant faithfulness to God by showing covenant faithfulness to his people. In the book of Ruth, the piety the people show is always through demonstrating chesed to one another. Boaz, a mighty man of valor, never makes an altar. He never fashions a temple. He, he actually only prays briefly and always for other people. The way he's relating to God in covenant faithfulness to God is by the way he relates to the people that he has been called by God to care for. Boaz also is not doing this drastically over-the-top generous thing that would just be like an okay thing if someone wanted to be super-duper generous. Boaz recognizes his responsibility to Ruth and to Naomi. He knows that this is something that he is required to do because they are his kin. He knows that Ruth has become a, a sister in a way as she becomes part of the family of God by demonstrating her love and affection for God's people. And so when Ruth shows covenant faithfulness to Naomi, she sets herself up for covenant faithfulness from all God's people who are practicing the love of God one to another. It is through the doing of said that people will know that we are Christ's disciples if we love one another, John 13, 35. Not only the world around us, who will know that something has drastically changed in us, we are disciples of Christ by the way we love one another, but the people of God will recognize us. We will be quickly welcomed into homes and into close relationship when people see our expressing said to those we see belong to God. And so there's this amazing thing that happens in this relationship. It is a romance, and we'll get to how that is. But the romance isn't attraction or that they're of near and marriageable age. The romance is God's great love expressed to Elimelech and Naomi. And the love of God's people one for another. And that Ruth and Naomi will eventually find that they have the exact same goal and ambition. They're equally yoked to be married, not because she's beautiful and he's young and handsome, but because they both have the same intention of glorifying God by practicing love to God's people. This is the great romance of the book of Ruth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, which never disappoints. Everything we say is superfluous, boring, and dry, but your word is streams of living water right into our soul. Transform us, I pray, by what you have caused to be written here and by your spirit at work in us. Lord, I pray that every single person here would be driven to be a mighty man of valor, a mighty woman of valor, a hero among God's people by expressing covenant love to you and to each other. Do this for your glory, we pray. Amen.